Hi everyone, this is Andrew Wolf. In this video I'm going to talk about alcoholic liver disease, but I also want to use alcoholic liver disease as a model to discuss the pathophysiology of cirrhosis. And cirrhosis, you know, in this country, alcoholic liver disease is one of the most common causes of cirrhosis, but cirrhosis can also be caused by a disease called NASH, which is non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, um, which is caused by a disease process leading to fatty deposition um, in the liver, in the interstitial spaces of the liver. It can also be caused by viral diseases, hepatitis A, B, and C. It can be caused by hemochromatosis, which is um, a deposition of iron in the liver and it can also be caused by a variety of toxins. And this list is by no means comprehensive. There are other things that can lead to cirrhosis. And they share, um, they share many aspects of the pathophysiology in common. And the major thing that they share in common is that there is inflammation of the liver and in particular inflammation in the space of DSA. Now if you haven't watched my uh, previous video about the uh, physiology of the liver sinusoids, um, just to give you a reminder, the space of DSA is a space that uh, it's otherwise known as the perisinusoidal space. Now this space is in between the endothelial cells of, of the sinusoid and the hepatocytes themselves. So the inflammation in all of these diseases is occurring in the space of DSA. Now I want to begin our discussion of alcoholic liver disease to talk a little bit about how that inflammation starts. Okay, so the first way that alcohol leads to inflammation of the space of DSA is that alcohol, now I'm using the abbreviation ETO, which is uh, an abbreviation for ethyl alcohol. Um, alcohol is actually a solvent to lipids and it is a solvent, in particular, to the phospholipid membrane. Now, now typically, um, we don't ingest enough alcohol to have a high enough concentration of alcohol to completely dissolve our phospholipid membranes. However, even you know a relatively small concentration of ethyl alcohol in our interstitial space can begin to loosen and disrupt the phospholipid membrane and make it act more like a liquid. And you know this has various effects on the cells. Um, it can it can start to disrupt membranes as membranes can actually um, as proteins in the membranes can actually sort of fall out of the membrane um, and it also can just make them more liquid so the membranes are moving around and they can't act the right way. But in any case um, alcohol acting as a solvent to the phospholipid membrane disrupts the cells and cellular processes and leads directly to inflammation in the space of DSA um, because of its effects on the endothelial cells in the sinusoids and the hepatocytes directly. So that's number one, alcohol act, acting as a solvent to the phospholipid membrane leading to inflammation. Now number two has to do with the way that the body breaks down alcohol in the liver. And actually it breaks down alcohol in more places in the liver um, through the alcohol dehydrogenase system or you can abbreviate it ADH alcohol dehydrogenase. And this is actually a system of enzymes and coenzymes 
um, in, by which the body breaks down alcohol. Now, this process actually starts in the stomach. And, you know, interestingly enough, one of the ways that, one of the reasons that men can drink more than women without feeling the effects of alcohol as readily is because men have a higher concentration of, uh, of alcohol dehydrogenases in their stomach. Um, but we also have this in our liver as well. And the way that alcohol dehydrogenase works is it works together with an enzyme, with a coenzyme. And the coenzyme is called nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide, and you don't need to know the name of it, um, but it's abbreviated NAD. Now, when what happens when alcohol is being broken down? Um, NAD is is part of what's called a redox system, and I don't want to get too much into the biochemistry of this. Um, it so the NAD is actually um, helping to oxidize the alcohol and turn it into aldehyde. So NAD, when you add NAD in, the NAD changes to a form called NADH. And when this happens, the alcohol changes to aldehyde. Now, I'm just giving you background information. This is nothing that you need to memorize for the purposes of this class. But what I do want you to be aware of is that this NAD, this NAD coenzyme is also very important for a lot of other things in the liver, one of which is gluconeogenesis. So when we ingest large amounts of alcohol, we end up actually suppressing gluconeogenesis. And this actually causes the liver to increase fatty acid. Production, so in order so that the body still has access to energy substrates, the the liver increases fatty acid. Now, because if if we drink heavy amounts, large amounts of alcohol all the time, we are going to be chronically suppressing gluconeogenesis and chronically increasing fatty acid production. And what this does is it causes fatty depositions in the space of DSA. I'm just going to say DSA. And so you know what I mean here. So in this um, will lead, um, actually I'm skipping a step here. Okay, the fatty acids actually, the fatty acid depositions actually um, cause inflammation by number one, it um, it activates Kupfer cells, and that's only one pathway. It actually has a number of other pathways, and that it uh, initiates the production of cytokines in the space of DSA. Now, Kupfer cells. Remember, these are the macrophages, so they're these are immunologic cells that are capable of initiating an inf inflammatory response. They are Kupfer cells themselves, actually are stimulated by NADH, by high concentrations of NADH um, to initiate inflammation via cytokines. Okay, so really the issue here is the um, there's there's two effects of high levels of alcohol in the liver. Um, one is is alcohol working as a solvent and then number two is the alcohol dehydrogenase system suppressing gluconeogenesis and, and thereby increasing fatty acid secretion uh, which directly starts a process of inflammation and then also NADH um, stimulating Kupfer cells to uh, increase the inflammation in the space of DSA. Okay and there's a third process in play here and the third process would be that when we drink very large amounts of alcohol, we actually overwhelm our ADH system. We've used up every ADH enzyme and coenzyme that we have available. And 
So the liver needs to go to secondary pathways to break down. And these secondary pathways are using other, other oxidants that produce large amounts of free radicals. And these free radicals cause inflammation. And because there's so many free radicals, it causes the liver to, the liver's trying to counteract these free radicals. So it actually causes depletion of antioxidants. Chief among them, the, the major antioxidant in the, in the liver is glutathione. And, you know, I'd almost consider this a fourth one, depletion of antioxidants. And this is because, you know, the ADH is, you know, we've drank so much alcohol that we've used, that we're using every ADH um, enzyme that we have, and there's still alcohol in the liver, so the liver's um, responding to this, uh, to the toxic levels of alcohol by going to secondary pathways of anti, of um, oxidizing the alcohol to break it down into aldehyde and this causes very high concentrations of free radicals and the free radicals cause inflammation um, to the cells of the liver because they directly damage proteins they directly damage DNA and all these free radicals also cause depletion of antioxidants um, which can also increase the amount of inflammation in the liver so those are the major ways um, that inflammation is caused in in alcoholic liver disease. So once we have the inflammation occurring in the space of DSA, um, what happens is we have this peaceful little cell here. And I haven't even talked about it yet. And this blue cell is a Kupfer cell, by the way. And it, we've already talked about how it, it is involved in the process of, of starting the process of inflammation. And this peaceful little uh, purple cell here is a stellate cell. Usually it has a very boring, unimportant existence, although I think we are discovering that it's more important than we initially realized, but it certainly plays a central role in the pathogenesis of cirrhosis. Uh, stellate cells usually live a boring life of storing vitamin A. But cytokines cause the stellate cells to be transformed from boring vitamin A storing cells to hyperactive fibrin depositing cells. And so we end up with fibrin deposition within the space of DSA. And actually, you know, the stellate cells do even more than, than just depositing fibrin, they actually start depositing collagen, um, fibrin, and proteoglycans, um, which you will recognize as um, the components of dense connective tissue. So the stellate cells are stimulated to produce to replace the entire f fluid interstitial space of the space of DSA into fibrin scar. So this looks like scar tissue anywhere else in the body. Now this has a few effects. I mean number one, the stella the hepatocytes are no longer no longer have ready access to the nutrients coming from the sinusoids. So the hepatocytes will start to die off. And number two, the space of DSA actually gets bigger and thicker because it's filling up with this overgrowing, hyperactively growing scar. So what we end up doing is we end up moving the entire system here and we end up having a much bigger 
space of Nisei that's filled with scar. And what that does is it narrows the lumen of the sinusoid considerably. Okay, so let's write that, this all down in our sort of flow chart here. So we have inflammation, and the inflammation stimulates the stellate cells. <coughs> and then stellate cells begin to produce deposit fibrin and collagen into space of DC. And that causes damage to the hepatocytes. And obviously, you, you can see how this can actually start to cause a positive feedback loop. Because what, is, what, is, what would a damaged hepatocyte do? Whenever you have cellular damage, you're going to cause more inflammation, right? So we're getting some positive feedback here, and, um, and we're getting to a downward spiral. Now, um, the other thing is we have, we have narrowing of the sinusoids. Now, if you narrow enough sinusoids, what happens when you narrow the sinusoids? Well, remember Poisson's law if we have a reduction in radius what effects does that have? Well, it's going to have a significant increase on pressure. Right, because pressure is inversely related to the radius to the fourth power. So even relatively small decreases in radius can have significant increases in pressure. And where is the pressure getting increased? Well, that increase in pressure is getting transferred back to the portal vein. Now remember, the portal vein is a low pressure system. It goes from, you know, 10 millimeters of mercury down to two millimeters of mercury or so in the inferior vena cava. Now, remember, the reason why it's so low here is because it's a vein that's already gone through a capillary bed. So if we increase pressures here, there really isn't a way for the body to compensate for increased pressure. So we just end up with backup into the capillary bed. And the capillary bed, remember, is is in the gut, and so we end up with with engorged um, veins and capillaries in the gut, and you know this leads to problems like esophageal and rectal varices, and it also interferes with gut absorption, and of course it leads to ascites. Okay, so again, we've got inflammation of the space of DSA that causes the stellate cells um, to deposit scar tissue in the space of DSA, and that narrows the sinusoids causing portal hypertension, and it also causes hepatocyte um, damage. And actually, you know, an alcoholic um, a person that's been drinking for many, many years and has had slow, steady damage to the liver can have very few uh, functional hepatocytes. However, like all other organs in our body, we have we have a lot of extra capacity. So, you know, you don't really start to notice missing hepatocytes until you've decreased the number of hepatocytes by about 80%. And then when that happens, you begin to notice loss of synthetic function with derangement with uh, derangement in coagulation, and you notice um, derangements in metabolic function, which 
with, you know, hyperbilirubinemia and ammonia, etc. And then, you know, I should also mention, and this probably isn't mentioned very often with um, with the damage that's done to the space of DSA, but the other cells that are very important that are damaged are the Kupfer cells. So this leaves the body open to enteric um, bacteremia, pneumonias, and really infections anywhere. This brings me to an end of my discussion of alcoholic liver disease and cirrhosis. Please take a moment to provide feedback, and if you have any questions, please leave them in the comments below, and I will endeavor to answer them. And I'm going to put up, up a couple links here, one to subscribe to my channel, and another one to um, as a quick link to the other gastrointestinal videos. Um, so if you want quick and easy access to my videos, please click, click one of the links below. Thank you very much.